Um, OK, so Jim Zemlin couldn't make it, so I get to interview Linus. I asked the community for lots of questions. Um, they provided it about two hours ago. <laughs> um, so let's start. Um, so first off, Linux, um, you announced that the version number is going to yeah. change. Yes. <laughs> let's start with the important details. Yes, the boring details. So you said uh, 3.0. Wow. Um, yeah, it's not out yet, but um, I did the RC1 release, so there's a 3.0 release candidate out that I cooked just before I left for this trip. If everything goes well, and it looks fine so far, in about seven or eight weeks, we'll have the final 3.0 release, and just in time for the, the year's festivities here. So I'm actually really happy about the whole thing. I'm just finally getting rid of 2.6 as a version number. So what is going to, is it going to be 3.0.1 or what? So I don't know how many of you have seen this, but Greg sees it every day because he maintains the stable kernel. Our old version numbering was 2.6 and then I made the third number. We're up to 39 right now. And then to make things even more interesting, Greg does the stable release, so he does 2.6.39.1 and counts stable releases this way. It just gets really messy, and then all the distributions have their own build version. So when you actually run Linux, you will run something like 2.6.39.7-13. <laughs> and, uh, and we've been doing this for a long time. And the 2.6 has been there for eight years. Eight years. Eight years yeah. and, uh, and it's been kind of meaningless. Uh, and part of the problem has been that we used to have this notion that, OK, we hit a big milestone. So 1.0 was networking works, yeah. right? 1.2 was, I think, the initial implementation of SMP. No, that was probably, uh, that was, uh, 1.2 was our first multi-platform. So that was when we supported Alpha and uh, M68K. Uh, 2.0 was network, uh, was SMP. Mm -hmm. uh, I forget it was 2.2 had, had some kind of, of issues. <laughs> we, 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 but we, spin lot. Oh, we, we did, so 2.0 was SMP worked. Kind of, <laughs> and 2.2 .2 was SMP actually scaled to two or three CPUs, and uh, we've we've always had this notion that okay, you need to have a feature to increment the version number, and then we change how we do development. So 2.6 for the last eight years, we decided we don't do versioning by features anymore. We just do this eight to ten week release cycle, and it's working wonderfully but it meant that 2.6 kind of stuck around, and it stuck around for a long time. And now 20 years of Linux means that we finally, I had the excuse to say, okay, enough. We've done this version numbering based on time, so let's do change the 2.6 based on time too. So now it will be 3.0, and you can do 3.0.1 yes. for your stable version. So we'll still, still have a lot of numbers, but the numbers will be smaller. And, uh, and I don't think we'll ever hit like 40 anymore. When we get to 3.20 or something, I'll just say, hey, uh, let's increment four. Four, to four so that we don't have these big, large numbers that are hard to re remember. And, and it sounds silly, but when I made my 3.0 release candidate, I created a diff to the v previous version. I have this script that does it every time when I do a release so that people who don't use the source management tool I use can just download the diff. And I created the diff not against 39, but against 29. Because when you're talking about big numbers like that, they all look the same. And I didn't notice. I was starting to upload <laughs> this diff against the wrong kernel version because once you hit 39, the numbers are just meaningless. So I'm hoping that now that we've renumbered the tree, uh, it will actually be easier to remember that, OK, 3.1, 3.2, the numbers are smaller. They're easier to manage. Good. Well, as somebody who deals with this all the time, I promise that if you ever changed, I would buy you some whiskey. <laughs> <laughs>
So I followed through. <laughs> so I found okay. no I, glasses. I need to drink this straight out of the bottle. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Classy. Uh, sorry, I just saw it. If anybody's glass. But um, I found the best um, whiskey I could find of you local can open whiskey. It, right? um, okay. Maybe we should wait until after. The yes. <laughs> Yes, it might be interesting now. Um, so thank you, because I deal with these numbers every day, and it drives me crazy. So well, I know it affects me a lot. You know, I, I hope this will clarify things, although right now it has also resulted in a lot of discussion about, OK, do we start doing new features now because we changed the version? And I say, no, 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 it's all the same. We just change the numbers so they're easier to remember. Right, so people have said, can we remove things? Like, people want to get rid of microchannel or ISA or um, IDE. <laughs> yes, yeah, no. Somebody here. Uh, Is Jens here? No, no but Chris got, goaded Jens to do oh. it. Yeah. Um, it was very. <laughs> you yeah, know, we're not getting no, rid of features now. No. No. It's, it's actually been one of the things that has worked so well for the last few years is the whole trying to be stable all the time. We used to have these big jumps when we removed features and rewrote the kernel and did big development changes. And it was necessary back, back in the 1.0 days, back in the 2.0 days. You had to really break the world. But it's been so easy for the last five to eight years when we decide, hey, we'll be stable all the time. You don't have to worry about things. If we ever break anything you do, we'll just revert the change we did so that it still works for you. And I think it's, it's helped us as developers, but I, I think users have been much happier too when, when they don't need to worry too much about being on, on a new ver kernel version. They know that everything is supposed to work the same and we'll continue that despite the version change. Yeah, it's also helped developers know that if they don't get their patches in now, right. three months from now, yeah. it'll, it, they can do it again. So it's not right. such a big deal to there's yeah. no pressure. It used to be yeah, when you had two and a half years of yes. development cycles. It was like you had to get it in then because if you didn't, you had to wait another two years, which yes. just does not work. It also uh, forced us to break patch changes into uh, tiny pieces and um, not break the build. Since with Git, I mean, we've made the rule that you can't break the build at any point in time. Yeah, we still break the build. But not on purpose. Not on purpose, <laughs> no. no we, and I think we're being pretty good about the fact that even when I release a release candidate, which is a very chaotic point in the development tree when everybody has, has pushed all their changes to me in the time frame of just two weeks, and even the first release candidate tends to be pretty good. Uh, we still have seven weeks to fix all the <laughs> bugs we've introduced, but so far it looks good. Yeah, good. So that's it for 3.0. It's no. not a different thing. No. no. Good. So um, in the 20 years, I mean, lots of new features. You mentioned the big features. Has there anything been recently features that you liked that we've done or that you found interesting? So I actually like the really boring features. I like the features that people don't notice as being new features. Uh, we've had many just performance improvements in the last few releases where we changed how we do. The one I like particularly is the file system name lookup changes. It speeded up enormously. On some of my loads that I run, uh, we literally had a 40% performance improvement in one release, and that's basically unheard of. Yes. But there's no new feature. There's no new interface for users. There's not, nothing nothing new going on. We're just doing the same old thing that everybody does millions of times a second, and we're doing it 40% faster. And that to me is really exciting, even though then selling features to other people, it's usually easier to talk about new exciting things that we do. And it's harder to sell, hey, we're doing all the same boring things, we're just doing them better. Well, doing things faster is a nice change, because normally we've been, like you, the joke a year or so ago is that we're getting bloated, right? Well, we still are pretty big, and thinking about the machine that I ran Linux on 20 years ago, we wouldn't fit on that machine anymore. True. But the good news is that even a cell phone has 
10 times the computing power of that machine these days. So nobody really cares about the fact that we do need more resources, but then we use those resources very efficiently. So as long as we stay ahead of the, or behind the hardware curve. We'll yeah, no, I mean, I, we're, we're, we've been growing, but I think most of the growth has been to do things that modern hardware needs to do and, uh, and do things that modern usage patterns needs to do, so. Because we don't add things or change the kernel because we feel like it normally. Normally it's because people ask for it, right? Or they That's want the it. hope, yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, I try to push back. There's still, I mean, there's a lot of kernel developers here, I know. And there's a lot of people who have their own thing that they're really excited about and they want to expand on it without actually necessarily having users yet. It's usually a very good feature and uh, you push the envelope and sometimes you add features that you don't have users for yet and that you think that in five years it will really be a big issue. And sometimes five years happens and nobody's still using it. So we, we have those things that, that sometimes we say, oh, we shouldn't have added that because it turns out to not be as useful as we thought it would be. So do we need user, uh, actual use case to add things? Because like, not that, hey, this would be nice if we uh, had a little more. I trip. have been arguing more for that, that we should, in order to merge into my tree, you don't just want to have a cool new feature. You want to have a cool new feature and you want to be able to point. And by the way, this distribution really, really needs it and has a lot of users for this feature already. So I've, I've been trying to push in that direction and, and I think it's been fairly successful. Yeah, one, I know a lot of kernel developers have objected to the C groups interface, the control groups, and some people argued that it didn't have initial users, but now we do. Well, that happened, and that's actually one of the interesting things is how often we have different user groups. So the C groups uh, interfaces were mainly done for certain server setups, and not very many people really used them, and a lot of people were unhappy because they complicated the memory management code, they made the scheduler more complex. They had a lot of impact on very core infrastructure and only a very small group of people used them. And then it turns out we ended up finding great use for it outside of the original target audience. And that's, that's always interesting. And it's interesting how often it uh, does end up happening, like all the SMP code that 10, 15 years ago was like, okay, this is the big iron, the server feature. And obviously today, every single high-end cell phone yeah. ends up <laughs> using SMP code. So it often ends up being the case that you have features that are targeted to one specific area. And then a few years passes and you actually end up noticing that, hey, those features really made sense in general. And that's one of the strengths, I think, of Linux is because we have the same kernel across so many platforms, and nobody else does this. If you look at, so uh, Apple has iOS for their low end and OS X for their high end. Microsoft has Windows CE for low end and real Windows for high end. And, uh, and Linux has never had that. Linux has always had the whole across the platform thing. And I think it's been really good for us. I think it's one reason why we are doing really well in the embedded space is that we never had a cut down kind of castrated version yeah. for the low end. We always had full features across the whole thing. And it, exactly because it turns out all those high end features eventually end up percolating down too. And the low end, I mean, we argue people, the embedded guys are like, nobody's going to care about power management but us, so let's do it in our own little tree. Right. But Google servers, I mean, people have real power needs yep. and big iron. Yeah, no, so it, it goes that way too. It's that, gone both ways. That, yeah, the power management grew up instead of growing down. Yeah. yeah. So, that's, um, so that leads into the people sometimes feel their features are just for them. So like the ARM community has been very, um, how do I put it nicely? Um, <laughs> Insular are thinking that they, they're doing things only in their own sandbox, that it's not going to affect everybody else. Um, for years, we've been trying to push back, and recently you've pushed really hard back. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you want to talk about that? I mean, how that's working out? 
for pushing uh, back to try and I'm actually part. happy to talk about how it's working out because yeah. in 3.0 RC1, one of the things that I'm really happy about was the ARM people were starting to really react to the fact that a couple of months ago we had a big flame war and I basically called them bad names. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and people were not very happy, and uh, some people thought it was just me being difficult, which sometimes happens. And uh, and it seems to be happening now that the ARM people are realizing that they shouldn't think of only their small platform and build for just that case, but try to make the code generic so that they share code amongst themselves, which yes. is a big step, because they it used to be that you had two different platform boards that were almost identical, and they had two completely different sets of source files for that platform support. But now they're also trying to share it outside of ARM, uh, which we'll see how well that actually works, but it at least means that now the people outside of ARM that are working on similar features see the ARM code because it's not hidden somewhere in the deep confines of the ARM tree. Yeah, we're cleaning it up also. Yeah. We're seeing, I'm seeing IP cores that are on Intel server or x86 servers yeah. that are also in ARM. And it's like, hey, that's the same driver. Let's yeah, no, that's, that's what I'm hoping for. Yes. Yeah. So, so is that going? So the diff for 3.0, <coughs> ARM didn't seem to quiet. Is that just because they've been scared off or are they getting? So it's hard to tell how well it's working. It seems to be working well. Part of it was I didn't merge everything from ARM because they're still working on it. At the same time, this was, I think, the first release ever where the ARM tree literally, or the ARM part of the tree shrunk. Mm. And uh, part of it was they moved drivers from their tree out to the generic drivers. That's the part you saw. But also within ARM tree, they did consolidate some stuff. So it's, it's beginning. And uh, I think it's partly because the whole embedded area is there's a history of people thinking about one particular platform, and they're not used to thinking uh, of themselves as being part of a bigger ecosystem. And uh, ARM is growing up, so along with that, they're also starting to hit all the same issues that, that the other platforms hit a long time ago. It's kind of a first, they're actually finally contributing their code back, which, we, yes, yeah. they didn't do that for a long time, they hid yeah. them. So yeah. then they contributed back in their own pieces, and now they're learning to play nicely yeah. with everybody yeah. else. Yeah, so uh, it's still early days, and uh, I'm hoping it's, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic. It seems to be working, but. Good. Okay. Um, well, speaking of ARM, I mean, Linux now on the thing is everywhere. It's in our small cell phones to yeah. everything. Um, a long time ago when you did the 1.0 release, you talked about total world domination was a goal. <laughs> and we're, we're, getting, we're getting pretty well. We're doing pretty well, but one of the things you said then was um, in order for us to be able to achieve that, we'd have to have the applications. Yes. The kernel was boring, and um, all the interesting stuff was going to happen in the applications. Um, do you think that's still true? It's less true than it used to be. I think we have the applications to a large degree. We may not have it all. Uh, the big problem as far as the whole world domination thing goes. And I'm not actually, I don't say world domination anymore. It was funny 15 years ago because it was so obviously a joke. And for the last 10 years, it's not been so much a joke anymore. <laughs> so it's no longer funny, so I, I stopped saying it. But, but if you look at all the, the areas uh, we are in, uh, we're doing really well on the low end, we're doing really well on the high end uh, servers, pretty much every single niche. The desktop is still something where we actually have the applications now. There are a lot of applications. Uh, it's a hard market to get into. Mm -hmm. And it's still the market that I personally, it's what I started doing Linux for. I started doing Linux because I wanted it on my desktop, I mean workstation, whatever you want to call it. And, and it's what I use every day. And I have a Linux phone and I'm really happy about that. But it's still the laptop and the desktop that I really work with. And uh, so that's a market that I don't think it's the applications. I think it's people, people who just it takes a long time to convince people to change what they're using. So they're still stuck on Windows and some are still stuck on OS X. And we'll get there someday. But. Okay. So we'll 
Uh, can we do anything to help that in the kernel, or is it just uh, just working with people? I've been trying to think what we can do in the kernel, and I don't know. I mean, we we have worked very hard at making the kernel do as well as it can on that kind of load. And I think most of the kernel developers, I mean, they often use the desktop the way yeah. I use the desktop. So for them, the desktop is really important. So kernel developers are very aware of the desktop. So the whole interactive performance and the whole user interface issues, as far as the kernel people are concerned, we have worked hard on that. Um, I don't know what we in the kernel community can do. I think it's up to, there are still application issues, but I think it's really up to distributions to very aggressively target the desktop. And I'm happy that some of them clearly are. Um, as somebody who's worked for a distro who did that, <laughs> um, we were profitable doing that. And uh, we, it's, but it's, it's, a, it's a tough business. Yeah. It's more of a business thing. Technically, we're there. We sell Linux preloaded on laptops, on desk workstations. You can buy them on p companies' websites. Just not today. Canonical's done a lot of work. Red Hat's done an awful lot of work. Yep. We're trying. <laughs> um, OK, so 20 years now. Um, it's been a long time to work on one project. Yeah, <laughs> um, I don't know. Some people are like flitter like from project to project. Yeah. And I've always been somebody who likes concentrating on one thing. I'm not a multitasker. I've had a few small projects in between, but I'm really happy doing one thing and feeling like I'm doing a good job at that one thing. So I didn't think I'd do it for 20 years, but now I don't. If I didn't do it, I'd be bored. I, so are you going to, so do you want to, you think you see yourself doing it for another 20? I'll be old by then. <laughs> I mean, I was really young when I started. And, and uh, another 20 years, at some point, there will be somebody young and hungry and energetic who comes along and shows that he's really good at it. And uh, maybe it will take 20 years for that person to show up. But at some point, somebody will show up. Uh, and, and that's the point where I think I'd stop, just if, if somebody else who's better comes along, I'm, I'm perfectly happy to say, hey, you're clearly doing a better job than I. Go, take it. But so how do, we, how do we keep Linux relevant to be able to hand it off in 20 years? How do we, how do we make I don't sure think that we succeed? A, I really don't think that's a problem. I, if you look at all the work we do today, a lot of it is hardware maintenance. And that doesn't seem to be going away. I mean, it's, if hardware ch stops changing, then at that point, maybe the whole tech industry comes to a screeching halt, <laughs> and there's nothing more for us to do. But so far, I mean, if you look at the kernel and what it does, a lot of what the kernel really does day to day was stuff people did in the 60s. The whole Unix mm -hmm. architecture is 40 years old. and. Uh, I don't think it's any less relevant today than it was back then. And I don't think 20 years will make a big difference. But we will have to update for new hardware and new usage cases as, I mean, with new hardware comes new, new software and new pla places where that hardware gets used. So I think it will be relevant in 20 years. I don't think that's the problem. So as long as we continue to evolve based on that, we'll be okay. Oh yeah, no, the, the one thing I don't want to be is I don't want us to get in, to be in maintenance mode where we don't live, where we don't make changes. Okay. So, cool. Um, and also, I think they've been asked, we can ask questions if people have questions to ask. I don't want to take all of them. There are microphones on the two sides. If you have questions, you can just go there. Um, let's see what fun things do I have left. I think I'm doing good. Um, yesterday at the open forum, the open forum contest um, discussion here, there's lots of talk about how open source software can help with um, disaster relief efforts. Yeah. Um, is there any role do you think that Linux can play, help play in that? That's a big topic here right now. So I don't know. I mean, 
one of the things that is personally very gratifying to me is how people are using Linux for things that I never envisioned, right? The whole, I mean, not just the markets, but also people using Linux and open source for reasons that were not my reasons, going into developing worlds and spreading the knowledge of technology and, uh, and making it a teaching tool. And I find that to be really exciting and I very gratifying that people say, hey, open source is perf perfect for this. Disaster relief, I'm sure it works really well. It's not, I have to admit, it's not something I've personally been thinking about. It's not what I'm doing, but. Oh. Um, is there a question? No, okay. Um, there is. Oh, there is? So S the, the single most memorable moment in the, the in these single years. most memorable moment. <laughs> you know, I mean, that really is hard to answer because to some degree, it hasn't been the whole project has not been a project of like a great idea that changed the whole project. That's not how it's worked. Quite often it's been small ideas with lots of different people being involved. And, and the small ideas, it's like plotting day-to-day -day work. And when you look, look at it a year or two or five years afterwards, you say, wow, we really made a huge change. But at no point was there the aha moment that this is how we're doing it. And uh, I'll go on a rant here, because this is one of my pet peeves with the whole technology industry, is that there's a lot of people who talk about innovation, and there's a lot of people who talk about being visionary, and that's what everybody always wants to hear at keynotes, right? The, the one big idea for the next 20 years. And my opinion very strongly is that that's not how the world works. It hasn't been these visionary ideas at any point. We've had lots of good ideas, but they were like good ideas that nobody thought were world changing at the time. It just turned out that good ideas with lots and lots of sweat and work turned out to be really great. Uh, so there have been very few of these single moments. I, like I say, the one single moment for me personally was actually back almost, well, now ni 19 years ago, which was literally when it went from a personal project to, to being something where I no longer knew the people involved. And that was for me a big thing. That was like, wow, now it's not my toy anymore. Now there's hundreds of people. I mean, at that time, it was hundreds of people who are using this project of mine that I've never met, and that was a big thing for me. But other than that, I mean, there's been lots, of, I mean, there, there's been exciting developments. When Oracle dis decided and may announce that they'll port yeah, uh, their database to Linux, that was like, okay, now we're in the big league, right? Because if you are a Unix and you have Oracle running on top of you, you're, you're a real Unix. So that was, that was like one thing. So big companies, IBM, starting to support. I mean, all these companies. But to me, personally, it was really a bigger deal when it went from this pet project, I talked to a few people that I knew, to going to hundreds of people I didn't know using it. That was, I don't know. But I really want to stress that it really isn't about the innovation. The reason I'm here talking about Linux is I think the kind of person who sticks to a project for 20 years and does it every day, 10 hours a day, uh, that I think it's the persistence and just hard work. And there's thousands of them now out there. And that's what has brought Linux to where it is. Not the great innovation, not the, all the nice things that everybody talks about the tech industry. It's sweat and hard work. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay, so my question is a uh, little bit technical things. So you mentioned, Linus, you mentioned about the uh, Unix history, yeah. very long history. Yeah. So now, and desktop Linux application is struggling, I think. And uh, uh, if so, and more aggressively, oh no, no. So web application is very aggressively now, right now. Yeah. So then, uh, if the Linux-based application, desktop application, is tracking more, maybe one year or two, one year, two years. So, usual people always use the web application. Yeah. That's my next question. If so, my, it's, that's my question. It is my question. If so, so you can say goodbye to the Unix because the <laughs> Linux kernel and the VM and the browser, that's all. There is no Unix layer. So how do you think about it? So the whole issue of applications moving from being like your running on your OS to really running in a web browser, it has already helped Linux enormously. Uh, and, uh, and it's clearly continuing to happen that you lose a lot of the specialized. It used, I don't know how it was in Japan, but both in Finland and then in the US, you had specialized applications for banking and for a lot of these that you had to run an application on Windows to talk to your bank or talk to anything like this. And that's all gone, obviously. Almost everything is a web application. And then that helps Linux because suddenly the operating system isn't that important anymore. Well, the operating system is still important. The differences between different operating systems aren't as important. And when the differences aren't as glaring, uh, now the technology matters a lot more. And now the licensing makes it, and the price, and, and just being available uh, matters a lot more. And that really helps Linux in the long run. That said, I don't think we'll ever see, well, ever is a long time, but I don't think the web applications will take over the world entirely. I think it's uh, replacing a lot of local applications, but I think we'll still have a lot of native applications. And, uh, and I don't think, for example, the Unix background of Linux is ever going to be a problem or something we want to forget about. I think the Unix architecture has been very successful and and it's one of our strengths that we had. We, we were able to build on top of good design uh, made by smart people long ago. Okay, thank you. I have another question for Linus. Um, how happy are you with Ubuntu? <laughs> And if you are not happy, or if you're happy, what would you change? <laughs> this question should actually go to Greg because I suspect the answer from Greg would be way more amusing, because he feels much stronger about this than I do. I, I think Ubuntu is interesting because they're taking a different approach from a lot of other Linux distributions, and I don't mind that, Greg. Talk to him afterwards. Uh, I think it actually has been very helpful to have a distribution that takes a very different and maybe less technical approach and a more user interface and user centric approach. And Ubuntu, I think, has been very successful thanks to that. Uh, and, and I think that's good. And I think it showed the other, other distributions to some degree a piece that they were missing. So having somebody do something different, the other people that, hey, they're going for a niche we didn't really look at. At the same time, we've had some issues on the kernel front where, where some kernel developers who I won't name felt that Ubuntu wasn't pulling their weight and helping no, as much as they no, could. No, no. <laughs> no, let me, can I, can I answer this? Please. <laughs> yeah. um, I go around and give lots of talks about who, along with John, about who does what kind of, who develops, helps develop the kernel, and um, showing what companies are helping sponsor that. And on all those talks for a number of years, people always ask, well, how is Canonical helping out? And I'm saying they're not very, they're very low on the, on the list. 
and a lot of people found that interesting. They didn't realize that. Um, so my only response was um, that they weren't contributing to the kernel. Um, they're still not a very large contributor to the kernel or most upstream source projects at all. Uh, the GNOME people verified that recently as well. Um, my only objection was I want to see the kernel community grow. In order to grow, we need to have more developers contributing. It is perfectly fine to take what we use and use it for whatever you want. By the license, that's, we have no objection to that. Um, I want to see those developers be able to contribute. Canonical has some very, very good developers. Um, I want to see them contribute, and they are. They are contributing more now. Over the past couple of years, they're doing much better and a lot more patches. Um, but Microsoft contributes more than Canonical to the kernel. <laughs> <laughs> you, there, that, that's going to be some headline now. Great. <laughs> um, but, and there's, more for, there's room for growth. I mean, I will admit, Sousa, um, we could do more. Um, we, there's all sorts of places we could do more. But as a kernel developer, I want to see more people do it, and especially those developers. They have very good developers. I want to see them contribute more. Okay. Hi. Uh, what was the, what is the toughest technical problem that you have faced uh, maybe during the development of Linux so far? What is the what? What is the toughest uh, the technical toughest? problem uh, which really bothered you? The, the biggest problems to me, there, there's, I, I'll give two answers to that. Uh, they have never been technical. I think all the technical development to us has been something we've been able to solve it and even when we made a wrong de decision and took the wrong turn somewhere eventually we'll figure out oh that was just a bad decision and we can fix it uh, so on the technical side I don't think we've had problems that I would consider serious the two areas where we've had serious problems was uh, documentation and help from hardware manufacturers some hardware manufacturers have not been supported and have been hard for us to support them. Which has always irritated me immensely and is sometimes just a problem from, uh, for users too when we say, I'm sorry, our support for that particular hardware, it's very common, but we can't support it very well because we're not getting any information from the manufacturer. So that's one problem. It's kind of going away since Linux has been growing so much that uh, a lot of the manufacturers are finding out that it really hurts them not to help us. The other big problem we've had several times is it is hard to develop a big project with thousands of people involved and tens or hundreds of companies that are major contributors and have completely different ideas of where they want to go. So there's been many times during the 20 years where we've had just big disagreements between developers. We've had people who were really unhappy with how development was done. We've had people who are really unhappy about their feature not getting used uh, when somebody else's feature was picked. So, so that, to, uh, to me, has been always the prime. If, if I lose sleep over something, it's always about politics and it's always about people. And sometimes I get really frustrated and I flame people on the mailing lists and I call them dirty names that I can't repeat in this situation. And... Uh, and that is the thing that can frustrate me, is the interaction between people. Uh, I'm happy to say that we, I think we usually solve our problems. But we've had times when, when we've, there has been really bad blood in the community where people just argue for months. And, uh, and that's, that's to me the big problem. I don't know about how other kernel developers see it. But. It's hard, yeah. uh, developing with people. But, I mean... The point I always like to make when you see people see you flaming or us arguing in public, um, these kind of discussions happen within companies among engineers all the time. Yeah. You're just not seeing those internal mails. So it's nothing that is unique to us by any means. No, I don't. And I mean, in some, I mean, people talk about, especially the kernel mailing list is fairly, 
famous for being <laughs> outspoken. And it's been suggested as being a cultural barrier sometimes because people have a hard time interacting on the mailing list because they know that they might get very negative responses. At the same time, uh, when you develop the way we develop, you have to be able to kind of clear the people People know what you're thinking because if you're subtle on the internet nobody gets it <laughs> it's just you can't do development and be polite I feel sometimes because people need to know where you are if you say that looks okay and I think the feature might work and I think it needs more work that is some people's way of saying no I will never touch it but if you actually say that on a mailing list, on a technical discussion forum, the other side will continue to do something that you really said no to. You just were too polite to say, hell no, I will never ever touch that code. And they will go on maybe for months, maybe for years, developing a feature that you really hate. And to some degree, I think our, our somewhat aggressive sometimes mailing list is a it's, it can be a bit daunting and a bit scary, but I think it's also healthy for development to let people be very honest about, no, I really don't like this, and, and that piece of code is really so horrible that I wish you'd die, right? That's well, the polite yeah, way of normally, saying it. Normally, <laughs> normally we try and make it technical. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we, we do get technical arguments, too. But, but one, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One good thing about um, you and those kind of arguments that I've noticed over the years, and you've changed your mind. I, I do change my mind. And that's okay, so Some, that's yeah, a very yeah. good... I, I, yeah. I, even when I flame somebody, sometimes it turns out that they were right and I was wrong. It's rare, but it happens. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, uh, and I try to be fairly gracious and admit it when I was wrong and say, yes, you are right. I'm taking your code after all. So. But that's good. So that's a, that's a good trait of our community, at least. We are willing to admit mistakes. Yeah. So I think we have time for just one more. Is that correct? One more? Yeah. There's a couple of more. Okay. We, we started late, didn't we? So maybe we can... Two more questions okay. then. Okay, sorry. Okay. Uh, uh, can you change a uh, mascot character in Linux 3.0? What is a new mascot character? A new what? Mascot. Oh, the mascot. You know what? We've changed the mascot, and that is actually something, that is a good feature for 3.0, would be. <laughs> yeah, not, not a technical feature, but you yeah, changed the mascot. But you know what? I really like penguins. and. Uh, for a while, we had the, the Tasmanian Devil was, was the mascot for one release because of the relief effort that we had when we went to, to Tasmania for one year. Okay, one more question. Um, so, hi. Uh, what do you think of the state of the cloud now, and where do you think it's going, and how do you think Linux will play a part in shaping the cloud? Wow, that's such a marketing question that I'm not <laughs> sure I really want to take that question. Maybe we, <laughs> I, I, I really don't want, uh, the, when it comes to buzzwords and cloud, I'm sure cloud is going to be very big and interesting, but, and people are clearly using Linux very actively in the cloud. But this is the vision, this, this is not what I do. I do the plotting work. Let's do another question. I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, we can do it. <laughs> hey, uh, are you still happy with the license, or do you think it needs an upgrade, or do you regret having chosen the GPL back then? Uh, I'm very happy with the GPL. Uh, the reason, the original Linux license, I, I don't know how many people know this, uh, probably most. I did not actually start out with the GPL. I started out with my own personal license that I wrote that was like one paragraph. And the license, I, f I have it somewhere, but it basically said, you can charge no money for this. 
you have to give source code back. And that was it. And uh, it was not a license that would probably ever stand up in court, or at least it wasn't well known. And then the no money can change hands turned out to be a problem very early on. Uh, even in like early 92, you had small distributions that would copy floppies for people at Unix users groups or selling them in Byte magazine or something like that. And they wanted to charge like five bucks for the service of copying two or four or 12 floppies at that time. Uh, and they said, I really need to charge money for this because it's my time and my flop case. I will change the license. I looked around and I thought the GPL version two was exactly what I was looking for, saying that I give this out because I like doing it, but I want people who make changes and improvements, I want those changes and improvements to come back to me under the same license. And I think it's a very fair license. I think it's a license that is also very successful. And I think it's something that really speaks to people at a very deep level, the whole fairness notion that I give you something, you give me something back. And, and I'm very happy with the license. It's worked very well. I don't want to extend it to any other areas. I, I personally don't care for the GPL version three. I think it extended it to, I give you something, you give me this code back and you promise not to do certain things with it. That was never what I wanted to do. So I'm very happy with the license. It's clearly worked very well. Why change? Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. So um, I think we're out of time. So thank you right. for talking about it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just do it. We'll discussion about, okay, do we start doing new features now because we changed the version? And I say, no, 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 it's all the same. We just changed the numbers so they're easier to remember. Right, so people have said, can we remove things? Like right. people want to get rid of microchannel or ISA or um, IDE. <laughs> yes. Yeah, somebody no. here. Uh, is Jens here? No, no but Chris got go to Jens to do oh. it. Yeah. Um, it was very. <laughs> you know, we're not getting no, rid of features now. No. No. It's it's actually been one of the things that has worked so well for the last few years is the whole trying to be stable all the time. We used to have these big jumps when we removed features and rewrote the kernel and did big development changes. And it was necessary back, back in the 1.0 days, back in the 2.0 days, you had to really break the world. But it's been so easy for the last five to eight years when we decide, hey, we'll be stable all the time. You don't have to worry about things. If we ever break anything you do, we'll just revert the change we did so that it still works for you. And I think it's, it's helped us as developers, but I, I think users have been much happier too when, when they don't need to worry too much about being on, on. Even more interesting, Greg does the stable release, so he does 2.6.39.1 and counts stable releases this way. It just gets really messy, and then all the distributions have their own build version. So when you actually run Linux, you will run something like 2.6.39.7 dash 13 <laughs> and uh, and we've been doing this for a long time and the 2.6 has been there for eight years eight years, eight years yeah. and uh, and it's been kind of meaningless uh, and part of the problem has been that we used to have this notion that okay we hit a big milestone so 1.0 was networking works yeah. right 1.2 was, I think, the initial implementation of SMP. No, that was probably, uh, that was, uh, 1.2 was our first multi-platform. So that was when we supported Alpha and uh, M68K. Uh, 2.0 was network, uh, was SMP. Mm -hmm. uh, I forget it was 2.2 had had some kind of, of issues. <laughs> we, 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 but we, Spin lot. Oh, we, we did. So 2.0 was SMP worked, kind of. <laughs> and 2.2 was SMP actually scaled to two or 
three CPUs. And uh, we've, we've always had this notion that, okay, you need to have a feature to increment the version number. And then we change how we do development. So 2.6 for the last eight years, we decided we don't do versioning by features anymore. We just do this eight to 10 week release cycle. And it's working wonderfully, but it meant that 2.6 kind of stuck around and it stuck around for a long time. And now 20 years of Linux means that we finally, I had the excuse to say, okay, enough. We've done this version numbering based on time so let's do change the 2.6 based on time too. So now it will be 3.0, and you can do 3.0.1 yes. for your stable version. So we'll still still have a lot of numbers, but the numbers will be smaller, and uh, and I don't think we'll ever hit like 40 anymore. When we get to 3.20 or something, I'll just say, hey, uh, let's increment four. for. for to four, so that we don't have these big, large numbers that are hard to re remember. And, and it sounds silly, but when I made my 3.0 release candidate, I created a diff to the v previous version. I have this script that does it every time when I do a release so that people who don't use the source management tool I use can just download the diff. And I created the diff not against 39, but against 29. Because when you're talking about big numbers like that, they all look the same. And I didn't notice. I was starting to upload this diff against the wrong kernel version because once you hit 39, the numbers are just meaningless. So I'm hoping that now that we've renumbered the tree, uh, it will actually be easier to remember that, okay, 3.1, 3.2, the numbers are smaller, they're easier to manage. Okay. Well, as somebody who deals with this all the time, I promise that if you ever changed, I would buy you some whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> so I followed through. <laughs> so I found. Okay. No I, glasses. I need to drink this straight out of the bottle. <laughs> <laughs> Classy. Uh, sorry, I, that's all. I, if anybody's glasses. But um, I found the best um, whiskey I could find of you local can open whiskey. It, right? um, okay. Maybe we should wait until after. This. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, it might be interesting now. Um, so thank you, because I deal with these numbers every day, and it drives me crazy. So well, I know it affects me a lot. You know, I, I hope this will clarify things, although right now it has also resulted in a lot. Um, OK, so Jim Zemlin couldn't make it, so I get to interview Linus. I asked the community for lots of questions. Um, they provided it about two hours ago. <laughs> um, so let's start. Um, so first off, Linux. Um, you announced that the version number is going to yeah. change. Yes. <laughs> Let's start with the important details. Yes, the boring details. So you said uh, 3.0. Wow. Um, yeah, it's not out yet, but um, I did the RC1 release. So there's a 3.0 release candidate out that I cooked just before I left for this trip. If everything goes well and it looks it's fine so far. In about seven or eight weeks, we'll have the final 3.0 release, and just in time for the the year's festivities here. So, I'm actually really happy about the whole thing. I'm just finally getting rid of 2.6 as a version number. So, what is going to is it going to be 3.0.1, or what? So. I don't know how many of you have seen this, but Greg sees it every day because he maintains the stable kernel. Our old version numbering was 2.6, and then I made the third number. We're up to 39 right now. And then to make things 